church, we're so glad to see you here, see your full faces. Why don't you stand? We're going to worship our God this morning. And welcome to everyone online. We're so glad you're, that you're joining us this morning. Why don't we pray really quick? Dear Heavenly Father, we acknowledge your spirit. We acknowledge that you're here and moving and speaking, Lord, and we want to be a part of it, God. We want to worship you this morning with all of our hearts, all of our minds, our bodies, and our spirit, Lord. We are directed towards you, Lord. Do what you're about to do. Speak what you're about to speak. We are open and wanting to hear you. We are open and wanting to feel you and to know you this morning. We worship you, Lord, and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Set our 
resurrection there's resurrection power your blood runs through our veins your kingdom triumphs over even the coldest grave come on we sing Jesus, come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles, and we bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. I still believe you're moving. I still believe you're speaking.
God, we invite your presence here today. Thank you that you are here with us. And we want to leave this place changed by your presence. So I pray that every heart that comes this morning, all the different journeys that they're on, some good, some bad, some happy, some sad, would you meet us here so tangibly? Would, could we feel your presence, God? And would you change us so that we leave different than we came in? When we worship you, we want to become like you. So come and have it our praises, Lord. We want to tell you this morning, you are our God. We acknowledge you are the one and only God. And we love you. We love you for what you've done for us. You loved us first. Your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. In darkest night, you are close like no other. I know you as a father. goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness will sing of the goodness of my God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered.
bless the Lord. We're coming to the table of the Lord here. You know, in the book of Acts, when the early church came together and the pattern was laid out in Acts 2.42, it says, they continued steadfastly, it says, in the apostles' doctrine, prayer, fellowship, and prayer, and breaking of bread. And he describes the foundational pillars of a community and operation and functioning. Obviously, the apostles' doctrine, the teaching of the word, bringing forth scriptures and understanding of what Christ has taught. Importance of prayer and fellowship, communion of the community coming together. But it also says a breaking of bread. They devoted themselves. It means that uh, they were passionate about something. And, and I believe the breaking of bread is a should be something we're passionate about. It should be something we get excited about, something we just don't, well, we just go through it as another once a month thing, activity. And no, there, there's something behind it. And the two layers are simply this. One is the remembrance of what Christ has done for us. That the night of his betrayal, he took up these two emblems, the bread and the wine, and then he says, for as often as you do this, it's a remembrance. He says, you're, you're triumphing uh, the, the sound of Christ's next coming. He's a victory. He, he's the king. He's, he's over everything. He dealt with our sin. But the other layer to this is gratitude. Because we can go through life not taking the time just to say thank you. To say, your goodness has been chasing me. and I haven't stopped to say thank you. Thank you for the goodness. Thank you for all that you've done for us. The psalmist writes in Psalm 103, and he simply says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. And it starts off right away. Who forgives all your iniquities, heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, all that is within me. He says, forget not all his benefits. And sometimes we can go through life, and I don't know how your life has been this last few weeks, maybe this last month, this last season. I mean, we're, we've come coming out of this thing, and it's like, but man, I'm tired. I'm mo mentally, emotionally, I'm spent. There's so many things been going on. And the table of the Lord is a time where we can say thank you. We remember what the Lord has done, and we say, God, I want to say thank you right now. Come with gratitude. Come with just saying, God, I thank you for everything you've done for me. And as we come to the table of the Lord, let's be mindful of the two levels. Not only what he has done for us, but that we come to him and we say, Lord, thank you for what you've done for us. Two beautiful emblems, the night of his betrayal. He picked up bread, the cup, part of their Jewish custom would have these things within the uh, regular going on of their day in, day in, out of activities. But the first is simply the bread. It's amazing that even in scripture, Paul says that we are the body of Christ and he calls us bread. He says, you're one loaf. <laughs> you're a loaf. We're a loaf. We're, we're just bread. And he's reminding us of the unity that we have in Christ. But the bread also reminds us of his body that was there and hung on the cross for you and I, there to take the punishment that was reserved for us and our sin. And he took that upon himself. Well, Lord, we just want to say thank you today that you died in our stead. Let's take together of the bread. Lord, if you didn't go, we would have had to have gone. So, Lord, we just say right now, thank you. Thank you that you went. You took our place. That God, in his sovereignty, he saw fit that you would be the one that would stand and take on the punishment, the beating, the whipping, the spitting, the, 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 the smiting, and then hung on the cross with those stripes. And by those stripes, though, that we find that we can be healed. So Lord, there's people in our congregation need healing right now. Lord, there are those that are dealing with areas even of surgery this morning. Lord, we lift them up, Lord. Those that are dealing with the ailments in their body, stomach areas, Lord. God, there's areas, oh Lord, in, in the bodies of arthritis and cancer and so many things, God. Mental uh, heaviness, Lord, and depression and anxiety. We pray right now healing over every individual in the name of Jesus. We hold our hands open. We receive of you, Lord. We have faith to receive from you right now the healing that we need in our bodies, Lord. And through Christ, we can have that as part of the goodness that chases us, that pr pursues after us, Lord. But then he picked up the cup, symbolic of his shedding of his blood, the blood that would be poured out, payment of our, our sins, that we can go 
forgiven him. It says that if he is just and able to forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us of all our iniquities. Why? Because of the blood that was shed. Let's take together this cup. Lord, we're thankful right now. God bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless your name. Bless the Lord, oh God. We forget not the benefits because you forgive us of all our sins, all our inequities. God, we're thankful. God, you do not set some apart. You say all of them can be forgiven. All of us can be cleansed because of what you have done. We say thank you, Lord. We come with gratitude, oh God. We go to no one else. We go to you, oh God, and we trust in you because of all that you've done. God, for every heart and every life today that weigh down in the heaviness of life, thank you, Lord, for freedom that we can walk in you. Freedom, Lord, freedom through Christ. And who the sun sets free is free indeed, and we thank you for that right now in Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Well, let's continue to worship the Lord here. We do have a bring it forth to collect the cups here this morning. Just wanted to give you a, a sort of a, house duties here uh, just because we don't want it to be on the floor because the red will stain the flooring so we'll just look after that thank you very much god bless you we'll continue to sing now
resurrecting power. I love what we prayed at the beginning, that we would be changed, that we'd go out different. And the resurrecting power does that, takes what's dead, makes it alive, takes what is going through struggles and finds victory, dreams, and hopes and areas that God wants to take and cause them to come alive. I'm mindful of the book of Ezekiel 37 and it talks about the valley of the dry bones. And sometimes just because of life, life gets seemingly like dry bones, dreams and hopes, different areas that we had plans of and it just seems like they, they just all of a sudden dry up. Something happened. It wasn't our fault, it's just life circumstances. But there is a power. There is a working of God. There's a voice that goes over the dry bones and says, come alive, come alive. But he called for the prophet Ezekiel to prophesy to the winds, to speak out a word, speak out a word and begin to prophesy to the winds, the north, the south, the east and the west. And, and as he began to prophesy that that which was dead came alive, hopes and dreams and situations of life all of a sudden bone to bone and they begin to assemble again back into a body that became an army as the breath of God comes upon it. And, and can I just pray for you today that if there's an area of life that seems to be just dried up, all of a sudden the, just the pain, the sorrows, the difficulties of life, I believe the Lord wants to just speak a word over you, but I want you to speak it over your life and say, yeah, Lord, I hear your voice right now. I need to speak life over. Father, Whatever the circumstances, situation is right now, Lord, I thank you. Lord, as we go through the areas and struggles of life, sometimes it just seems to seem our eyes see and it's dried up. And Lord, he says, can these live? And we go, well, Lord, you know they can live. And yeah. So Lord, we begin to speak over the dreams and the hopes and areas of our life right now. We begin to call it back to life. We begin to say, speak, O winds of God, winds of God, fresh winds of God, life of God, begin to speak over our hearts, begin to speak over our homes and over our marriages and over our lives, over our jobs and our finances. We thank you, Lord, that we can call out with the prophetic voice and say, winds of God, blow again and let the woes dead come alive. That which was struggling, all of a sudden have victory. That which was dry, all of a sudden it sprouts up with life again. God, I thank you, Lord, that you are always doing something new. You're bringing newness to us, Lord. So I pray for every heart and every life here today, Lord. God, that we would stand with you, not just wait for you, we'd stand with you and begin to speak over our life the promises and blessings of God in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Now, well, quickly, have a look around, and believe it or not, there's actually a bottom to the face that you've been looking at and staring at all this time. There's an actual chin. There's an actual just... This is the body of Christ. This is us. It's so great to be here. Uh, God bless you. Why don't you be seated here this morning? Being back in the house of God, it's uh, great. And I encourage uh, those that are perhaps online and uh, you've been with us for some time, I encourage you, come on back. Come on to join us. We have enough room. We're still spaced out, but there's room for enough for everyone. You are welcome and you belong here. Well, the body of Christ is uh, uh, a great, the great place to be. It is uh, nothing like it. Well, we do want to encourage you to continue in the areas of your faithfulness, uh, particularly in the areas, first of all, in uh, tithes and offering. We give of our tithes and offerings unto the Lord because, well, the Lord desires it of us. And uh, God says, you know, that which I give unto you, your stewards of it, bring back 10% so that I can also work in the other 90 that you have. Tithes and offerings you can give uh, online through the church center app that you do happen to have, and you don't have to register with it anymore, but you can use it for uh, the giving of your tithes and offerings or from our website. It's all, all available there, and uh, you can also do it old-fashioned way uh, by sending in a check to the church address. It's available for you there or e-transfer. So be mindful of that. We continue to look forward to your prayers that come into us. Uh, we do pray. We do uh, uh, encourage one another to let us know what we can pray for, how we can build you up and uh, follow up even with a phone call, uh, connect with you somehow. Uh, if you're new in the house, just want to remind you, please fill out the connect card that was at the uh, front so that we can have record of your visit. Uh, sign up for our newsletter. That's where you get a lot of the information of what's going to happen, what's going to take place. Um, what do we have here for us um, for upcoming announcements? I don't think we have any upcoming announcements. I do want to say this, July 25th. Sunday, July 25th, we are actually going out to the park after service. Uh, we have a site over in uh, 
I think we're in Victoria Park area. We have a site, but the 25th Sunday, we're going to get together, bring some food. We're going to just have a good time in the afternoon as the body and uh, play some games and get to know one another uh, for time of fellowship. So that is July 25th. Well, we are so pleased to have uh, Aniston Elias with us in our children's ministry leader, and we're going to dismiss the children uh, at this time. So if we have kids in the house, which we do, uh, you're free to go uh, with Aniston and be a part of the kids' program. Um, man, I love being able to say that. I just love the fact that we can say, yeah, we got a children's program. We got a leader. We got kids. It's all good, man. It's good in the house. So praise God. Thank you, musicians. Well, we are dealing with a series called Encounters with Jesus. And, uh, you know, God is constantly wanting to interact with us, to have a connection with us, not just at salvation time, but on a regular basis where we have encounters with him, where we can look back and say, well, this is when God met me, this is when uh, God touched my heart, touched my life, or this is when God revealed something. We have encounters in our life. And the thing about encounters is that when you encounter God, somebody changes, and how many have figured out that it's not God? You have an encounter with somebody, usually somebody's going to change. Something's going to happen. There's going to be a revelation. There's going to be a connection. Maybe there's even an offense. Who knows? But when you connect with somebody, somebody's going to change. And when it comes to connecting with God, God doesn't change. All of a sudden, God doesn't go away and go, oh, I never thought about it that way. Yeah, okay, maybe I better do something a little different. No, when we encounter God, it's us who changes. And these encounters with God are lessons about what God wants to do in our lives. How does God want to change us? How does God want to build us, encourage us, correct us? Something that he's going to deal with us. Well, out of Luke 17, verses 11 to 19, we'll get to it in a minute, but it's Jesus and the ten lepers. And uh, Jesus in this encounter, is there's a lesson in it for us beyond the lesson. You know, leprosy isn't something that we really read about too much. It's interesting. When I look back into India, I've been over to India, into Vishakhapatnam, and Vizag on the uh, east coast there and uh, a number of times, and uh, I just quickly looked. And just in that area alone, there was close to 45 to 50 colonies uh, for, for leprosy still because of it still affecting uh, that area. But it's not something in our part of the world. And yet, uh, uh, though we have the modern t medicine, uh, about 10 million people around the world are still affected by leprosy. One form of leprosy, just to give you a little information, affects the nerves to the place where you, you don't feel pain, but you don't feel anything. And the thing with, with this is that infection can easily set in because you're not aware of the pain situation. You don't guard it, and infection can set in. And what happens is that infection brings ultimately a degeneration of the tissues. And uh, limbs ultimately can be simply deformed, but eventually they can fall off. And it's not just the sight. It becomes the smell because of the open wounds, because they, they just aren't treated in, 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 in a proper way if it's not looked after. And although today we, we know the disease is not easily transferable, uh, especially with the medicine today, it can be healed and dealt with. But back in Bible times, it was felt very, very, very um, transmissible. transmissible. Uh, people can be affected by it. And what happened was when somebody had leprosy, that they would, uh, when they first thought they had leprosy, they'd go to a priest and they'd go to the priest and say, here, here is this situation. And based out of the book of Leviticus and Numbers, they, they would have a prescription of what to do. And the, and the high priest would look at it. And over a period of time, if it's not dealt with properly, they would say, yeah, you have leprosy. They would examine it and say, yes, you do. And as a result, they were immediately isolated. They were pulled out of the community, out of the family, and they couldn't return to normal society until they were uh, cured or healed. Uh, and uh, it's, it's interesting that the Bible calls leprosy, uh, when you look at it in Leviticus, it's called a rising of the flesh. <laughs> now, that's got a whole spiritual message to it right there. Leprosy is the rising of the flesh, all right? Just keep that in your mindset. But it's a rising of the flesh, and, you know, it might be like eczema in our, in our thought. What happens is there's redness, and after the redness, all of a sudden it becomes an open sore, and then after the open sore, it begins to smell. It gets worse and worse. Flesh dies, and then it just the wounds get bigger and bigger. Soon uh, the flesh falls off. Parts of the body are affected, fingers, toes, eyesight. Uh, it just becomes a totally debilitating disease um, that works in their lives. And you, you suffer in isolation until life is over or until you're healed. 
and uh, there would be uh, uh, the prevention of individuals now being in community. You were isolated. You were outcast. You were ostracized. You were not allowed to be part of the community, and ultimately even the family would shun them. And they would lose their jobs, and the, the, the need for income would be so bad that they would be on the streets begging for finances, just eking out an existence. How do we get past this? And the, the leprosy all of a sudden would just become so debilitating that hopes and dreams ultimately would also die off because of this leprosy. So with that backdrop, Jesus encounters 10 lepers who were Samaritans, weren't even part of the Jewish community. They were even a secondary cast off. They were further removed. And yet Jesus encounters these 10 lepers. Let's look what happens in Luke 17 verses 11 to 19. Now it happened as he, Jesus, went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered into a certain village, there he met, met him uh, ten men who were lepers who stood afar off, as they would. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourself to the priests. And it was so that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and said with a loud voice, with a loud voice, glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Makes note of that. So Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were, were, they not, were, not, were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. All right, so we've got this beautiful encounter of Jesus and these 10 lepers, these Samaritans who are lepers. And again, there's lessons to be read underneath this. Oftentimes we look past these uh, beautiful encounters of Jesus and we go, well, that's great. 10 got healed. Isn't that awesome? Then we just keep moving on. And that's really not the whole picture of the story here. It's not all that we are to learn from. Uh, we're, we're to understand that God takes situations, including ones in your life, that God wants you to learn from it, not just experience it, but learn from it. There's something deeper that the Lord wants to work. Let me just tell you this. God in his sovereignty, but in his mercy, will never let go to waste any crisis, trial, struggle, and difficulty of life. He will never let anything go to waste. He will always, by his grace, by his mercy, step in and not just work something in your life, but make something in your life to make you better. He's working in you. Romans 8, 28, he, makes, he works all things unto good. They're not good, but unto good to those who love God and are called by his name. He works good. So nothing is wasted. And, and in case you have not noticed, and I know many of you know this already, with Jesus, everything is a test. Everything's a test. The, the, the test is not a pass fail, but will you grow? Will you move on? Will you develop? Will you mature? Will you receive what God is doing in your life, including correction or whatever it is? Will you let God work in your life? Now, let's just do a little math, and I know some of you will hang your head really quickly. Math, it's too early for math. All right, it's very simple. The question is very simple. How many? How many were there that were able to have faith enough to receive healing from Jesus? Now, now we'll do prices right. We'll let whoever gets it closest to without going over. Okay, how many were there? How many? Ten. Good. You guys passed. All right. Ten. Ten received healing. Ten of them obeyed. It says, as they went, they were healed. Ten lepers. All ten of them. All 10 of them received healing. Now, you would think, well, that is just the whole picture of the story right there. We would stop and we'd go, God, you healed them all. All 10 of them obeyed and they were healed. But yet, while 10 were healed, Luke does not just stop right there. He doesn't say that's the whole idea. He begins to draw his focus in, as it were, onto not just the faith of the men and the fact that they obeyed and the fact that they were healed because obedience is key for every one of us. If we want to receive what God has for us, obedience is needed. It's great. But one came back, and that's the one that Jesus points out, lifts up, and begins to praise. He says, don't worry about the ten that got healed because that's not the important part. The important part, there was one that came back. 
And Jesus points this out for us. This is, there's more to the story than 10 getting healed. Now, just to let you know, it, it would not have been easy for the 10 to go back to the priest and in that going back being healed. You got to remember, they were still lepers. When Jesus said, go and show yourself to the priest, go show yourself and allow him to, to uh, uh, pronounce you clean. As, as the lepers were going back, some of them, their leprosy was evident. Maybe they were bandaged. Maybe they were crawling. Maybe they were hobbling. Maybe they were crutches. Maybe somebody else was carrying them. They were lepers as they began to make the way to the priest. And sometimes we want Jesus just to heal us instantaneously, but sometimes it's the walking out of obedience that brings the healing. It's the walking out of the word of God that says, go and show, go and show. And you go, well, I don't want to show. I, I don't want anybody to know. Well, sometimes God says, if God gives you word, the word sometimes is go and show. And you've got to make the journey. It's a difficult journey. It's a hard mission. It can be in a sense, but God, I don't want people to know. But sometimes, not all the times, but sometimes God's asking you to step out in obedience so that you put away what you think is the way to go. And God says, no, I need you to go. And then I need you to show. And all of a sudden here, they spent their life begging, calling out, asking for just existence. And now he had to make it public in this going and showing to the priest on a journey. And it took faith. 10 of them had faith to receive the healing. They were healed. But this one guy, Jesus said, had something different about his faith. He makes a distinction. And he uses this word faith, this word faith that Jesus used, your faith has made you whole, made you well, is the Greek word, it's, it's, we would pronounce it pistis, all right? P-I-S-T-I-S, all right? And he says, your faith has made you whole. And when we read the New Testament, this Greek word, oftentimes we just see it as faith, just faith, just faith. But when you go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, and on, it talks about the uh, fruit of the Spirit, you know, the love, peace, joy, and the kind, and listen to them all. And all of a sudden, he says, in faithfulness. Well, that's that same word. And it's not just faith, but it's faithful. Your faithfulness has made you well. Not just faith, but being faithful, being full of faith, being having that faithfulness in your life. And that word faithful in that sense is belief, it's conviction. It's uh, the, the willingness and deep-seated belief to act on what you believe. You see, we, many of us have this faith level that we believe certain things, but when you're faithful, you act on that faith. You are resolved and you do what your faith says to you. And all of a sudden, this man didn't just have faith to receive. There was something about him that he was faithful. And there was a different response that came out of this man because he was faithful. He was filled with faith. And I believe it's about faith this morning. But it's not just about faith, it's about faithfulness, about being faithful. And here's what you need to see. Ten lepers had faith. Ten lepers, Samaritans, outsiders, ones that were undeserving of the covenant of God, undeserving of the goodness of God because of their cast out, un, not part of God's people. That's you and I. Every one of us is the same. We're just like these Samaritans that were lepers. We were undeserving. We had nothing in us to deserve it. And yet they had faith to receive. But it says that these 10, these 10, it says, were cleansed. And the word cleansed here in this word is the uh, uh, catheterizo. We would get catheter from. My wife's a nurse. And we would have our bantering about the different stories of nursing. I'll save you all, that aspect of that. All right. But basically saying they were cleansed. Yeah, Gary's sitting there going, yeah, you know what I'm talking about as a nurse. Uh, it says, hey, they were cleansed out. They were cleaned out. They were cleansed of the leprosy. They were healed of the leprosy, all right? But Jesus goes on. He says, hey, he says, weren't there 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? And I don't know if you figured this out yet. When Jesus asks a question, it's not because he doesn't know. It's a rhetorical question he's asking us. Get this message out of this picture here. There were 10 
All ten were healed of leprosy. Only one came back. Where, where are the other nine? You know what? It doesn't tell us where they are. But it tells us about this one. He says, rise up and go. Your faith has made you well. Made you well. The word in the Greek here is the word for salvation, sozo. And it means to be not just healed, but you're set apart for purpose. You're elevated to a realm of, of blessing in your life. Your faithfulness has set you apart, set you to the place where the, the, the 10 got blessed, but this one came back with a greater blessing for some reason. You see, there's a faith that believes, but listen, there's a faith that abides. There's a, there's a faith that believes, but there's a faith that sticks around and stays with it. That says, I'm not going anywhere. There's a faith that receives, listen to me, but there's a faith that returns. The faith that receives 10 had, only one had faith that returned. And his faith was a faithful. One that says, I'm coming back. The one that says, I'm sticking with it. The one that says, you can't offend me. And I stopped returning. You can't disappoint me. You can't all of a sudden make me feel bad about myself that all of a sudden I'm not going to come back. No, there's a faithfulness in this person that he says, it doesn't matter what happens, I'm still coming back. I'm still going after. I'm still pressing in. I'm still abiding. There's a faith, but then there's a faithful. And, you know, faith is beautiful. By grace, we have been saved through faith. Faith is beautiful. Faith brings us into that relationship. Faith is that response to God, the utter trust in the Lord. But God wants us to get past that faith to becoming faithful. That there's a returning in our hearts and our lives to what God wants, to what God has for us. And let me put it this way. Faith isn't finished until it's faithful. Faith isn't finished until it's faithful. We go from faith to faith, strength to strength, glory to glory, but we go from faith to faith. What is that faith to faith? It's when our faith goes to the place where it matures and it becomes solid and, and re resolved and concrete with commitment that we go, I'm not moving. And you're faithful. You're returning. You're again and again and again. Recently, we, our dog became a dog home again. We had a dog for 15 years, Shiloh, and uh, all our family really enjoyed Shiloh, but uh, Shiloh, all dogs go to heaven, all right? So he went to be with his maker. Another story, anyway. So, <laughs> so uh, but after a few years of just not having a dog in the house, we uh, ended up with another dog, and uh, the dog is a golden doodle. So if you're wondering what a golden doodle is, golden retriever mixed with a poodle, you get a golden doodle, all right? So it's, uh, it's a poodle that is, has this smartness of a golden retriever, but the uh, energy and excitement and uh, bounciness of a poodle. All right. So, so we're enjoying this uh, poodle. We're training this poodle. It's more training us than we're training it. We're training it with treats. It's food-driven. Uh, rewards really nicely when you give them food, just like a lot of us. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. All right. Give us food. Amazing what we'll do. All right. So, but here's what I found is that I'll take this dog for a walk, and uh, each time he obeys the commands, I give him a treat. It's like we're best friends. It's like, come on with me and give him a little treat or sit or roll over or whatever. He can do all these things. It's great. You know, we go for this long walk, and by the time I fed him about a pound and a half of dog treats, all right, this dog is my best friend. This dog will do anything for me. This dog is just listening to me. It's incredible. And you know what? I don't expect much out of this dog. The dog is simple. For me, it's simply... Don't bite me, don't pee on me, and leave my shoes alone. I have really low expectations of my relationship with this dog, but the dog, after a while, it's great. You know, it's fantastic. And then all of a sudden, I can be gone for half the day, part of the day. I come walking through that gate. That dog is bouncing like crazy, jumps up, jumps into my face, claws me, begins to chew on me, begins to do whatever he can, and even goes after my shoes, whatever. And if I'm not standing in the right place, he might just even pee on me. And I'm going, what just happened? I feed you. I clean you. I house you. I even give you the proper shots to keep you, whatever. You know, I, I walk with you. I am your best friend. And then you do this to me. In some sort of comparison, can that be us with God? 
Because everything we have comes from God. Everything we have, God looks after us, cares for us. He feeds us. He, he, he gives us the breath that we breathe. He covers us. He builds us into relationships. All of a sudden, God is pouring out blessing and blessing and blessing after us. And then every once in a while, we come up to God, and it's like we don't even know who God is. God says, hold it. I've just been with you all this time, and, and, and now you've, like, forgotten me. we got to go through all this again? Mm-hmm. And again? Mm-hmm. And sometimes our life becomes like this golden doodle, by the way, we call Jasper, all right? But the point is, is that how much does God have to do in our lives to, that we get it? That God is our master. God is God. God is over everything. God gives us everything. Everything that we have comes from God. What's it going to take to receive, not just receive from him, but here it is, to return to him that we abide with him, that we spend our life experiencing that relationship, not just to receive, but to return, not just to take as it were, but to walk with him in an abiding sense that he's able to experience that gratitude, that sense of giving back to him for all that he's done, that we recognize him as our master, we follow him and not just receive from John 10, Jesus said, my sheep, hear my voice, they know me and they follow me. And Jesus is painting a picture of a shepherd and sheep that have a relationship. They don't just have an awareness of each other. That's called a hireling where somebody just walks in, does the job, walks away. There's no relationship. The, the shepherd here, he, he sleeps with them. He, he cares for him. He's even willing to give his life for him. And there's such a relationship. We don't just acknowledge him. We have a relationship that we return to him. We abide with him. We have this relationship where all of a sudden our faith isn't just faith to receive. It's, it's faithful and we return to him. He who began a good work in you, Paul says in Philippians, he says he, he's sure to finish it. He'll commit to it. But why is he working on it? You know why? Because you're not ready yet. You're not finished yet. You're not perfect yet. None of us are. Our faith is not faithful yet. So God works on us. He constantly is molding us and shaping us. And he, he wants to turn our faith into being faithful. But that means we have to go deeper. To, be, to simply receive from the Lord doesn't take much faith. In the scope of faith. But to return to God, to abide with God, calls us to become faithful. And that means going deeper. Now, a long, long time ago, and I know when you start off saying a long, long time ago, some of you young people will say, I'm really old because that's what I'm saying a long time ago in my day. And, and some of you are looking at me and going, you're still thinking I'm the young preacher. And I appreciate that. It just means that you're older than me. And that's okay because we honor those that are older, right? So either I'm giving you honor or I'm getting honor. It doesn't really matter. All right. Okay. I don't know where was I going here. I got to remember this. <laughs> I'm getting older. Um, a long time ago, it used to be that when, when you got saved, relationship with the Lord, you were all in. Like, boom, lights on. This is great. All in. All right? You, you, I mean, I mean when, when you got saved, you, you went to church. All of a sudden, every Sunday, you're in church. And you weren't in church just once. You were in church twice because if you had two services, one you attended, the other you served. And then in the afternoon, you, you had church fellowship, right? You had that Pentecostal peach juice. All right? And, and then you also had the egg salad sandwiches, and that was like a, a buffet type of thing. And, and then all of a sudden, your whole life was built around Sunday going to church. And then if you had church Sunday night, you went Sunday night. Now, I'm not saying all this is good. I'm just saying how it was, all right? All right? And then you went to church midweek because you didn't have enough Jesus in you to last a Friday. So you showed up at Action Night or midweek program, and there you got your certificates and all your badges that you could put up on your wall because you were affirming the fact that you were all in. And on Sundays, by the way, you went to church before church. It was called Sunday school because you had to learn the Bible before you could go to church. You were just all in. It's just the way it was. Now, again, I'm not saying that's the way it should be. I'm just saying there was a sense of being all in today in the Christian circles in the church that if you were a member of a church, you said, hey, I go to church. I I'm a regular attender of a church. Today... It's 1.4 times a month. That's regular attendance, 1.4 times a month. 
We went 1.4 times a Sunday. But now it's 1.4 times. That means once a month you go to church on a Sunday and then you show up once and you leave early. That forms 1.4. And it's just like, how did we get to this? And you talk about serving. Serving is down to 30% of the general population in a church of who serves. A prayer meetings. There are more people asking for prayer than people attending prayer meetings. And again, I'm not telling you, I'm not saying this to judge or say anything. I'm just saying what is, what was and what is. It's just how it's transitioned. And now we look at people wanting to say, well, I have faith to receive, but is there faith to return? You were all in, reading the Bible, prayer meetings, you're giving back to God, you're serving, you're, you're committed. We have faith to receive from God, but are we faithful to return to God? And again, I'm not painting a picture of a works mentality or what the do's and don'ts have to be. I'm talking about what was and to what is. But to give back, to be the one, the one. Jesus lifted up the one that came back. He did not talk about any further the 10 that were healed, the nine that went away. He says, well, were there not 10? Where's the other nine? Let me talk about the one. He didn't go on and judge the nine. He simply, let's talk about the one. And he began to lift up the one. And what's happening for a lot of people is that we want the fruit, we want the blessings, but we don't want the work that goes with it to continue on. And I believe it's a call for us just to examine ourselves. Do, do I want the fruit simply because I want to receive or am I willing to build roots in my life? Roots that go deep, roots that go solid down, that allow to contribute for the fruitfulness in my life. And we have to realize that in, until we are faithful, you really can't bear the fruit. Because Jesus doesn't give us the fruit, we bear fruit. We grow fruit. Fruit comes up from within our life, and all of a sudden, by the Spirit of God, we grow fruit. This one leper came back. He was faithful, and Jesus praised him for it. In verse 15, he asked that question. Hey, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he came back. He's praising God in a loud voice. He throws himself down at Jesus' feet. He thanked him. Gratitude. He was a Samaritan, wasn't worthy of any of it. Jesus asked, we're not all 10 cleansed, where are the other nine? 90% didn't come back. That's, that's a sad stat of, statistic of that time, of that situation. And then we go, well, why didn't they come back? And we come up with a lot of excuses of why they didn't come back, but you know, they don't talk about why they didn't come back. Maybe they, maybe they simply got busy. And true, you know, thinking of a leper, when all of a sudden he's healed and his whole life was about begging, being on the streets, not having, now he's got to go find a job. He's got to reintegrate back in society. He's got to find a job. All of a sudden, maybe he's asking, hey, did she wait for me? Or did she go get married? And if she waited for me, what kind of relationship do I have with her still? And all of a sudden, he's got to work through a whole bunch of relationship details. And all, all of a sudden, the cost of what does it mean to, to be now... I'm healed. If I go back to the healer, he's going to ask me to become a disciple. If I have to be a disciple, then I have to be sharing the gospel. And if I have to share the gospel, who knows where he's going to send me? He's going to send me to some foreign country. And all of a sudden, I don't know if I want to do that. And people just back off. And it's a lot like today where people maybe are shy coming to the Lord because what's he going to ask of me? I'll, I'll get healed, but what's he going to ask of me? Maybe, maybe I don't want to show up. Maybe I don't want to be a part of it. But yet the one... The one came back, and he says he was made whole, made well. This guy returned and worshiped God, and he fell down. Well, you know, look, a bunch of good people here. Anybody here happen to have uh, a $50 bill you want to give me? Just asking. Hey, it's, it's a pastor. It's church. They, everybody always says we ask for money. We, we, we've got a couple. You, you got a 50? Okay, bring it. I don't know if you guys know who this guy is. This is uh, uh, Trent Boyce, and he's actually the boyfriend of Aniston Elias, and they've been attending now. And uh, if I can take 50 bucks from you, buddy, I mean, this is a $100 sermon, but I'll take 50. Good stuff. Thank you. Okay. That's it. That's all I wanted. Just checking his faithfulness. That's all. Okay, so in Luke 17, we, we, we find one One comes, it's just 50 bucks, people. This is a $500 sermon. Come on. So, 
Did I really take his money? <laughs> yeah, I did. Okay. All right. Well, okay. So did he give me 50 bucks? He did, didn't he? But the, the point is, is it wasn't his 50. I gave him 50. He simply gave me back what was mine already. And I know we would look at that and go, really? The point is this, it's a whole lot easier to give back something that doesn't belong to you. Let that sink in. It's a whole lot easier to give back something that doesn't belong to you. It was easier for the leper to return back to the Lord because everything that he had received up to that point wasn't his. He never got his healing. He never got his transition of life. He never got all of a sudden the, the working of God's and all of a sudden his inclusion and everything that happening in his life come back into the community. And God, God is asking for from every one of us is simply a return of what he's already giving us. And all he's asking is will we return by faithfulness what the Lord has already given to you. And I'm talking about everything that God has commanded. What's the greatest commandment? Well, you shall love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we go, God, you, you want me to love you like that? Okay, I can love you like that. And we begin to pour out our love. But then we go, well, why are we pouring out our love? Well, because he told us to. Well, no. We love God because he first loved us. You see, the return of the love is only because he first gave to us his love. We're only giving back to him because he already gave to us. And God says, I'm simply asking for after I've loved you, would you return that love back to me? A love relationship. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he says, I want you to offer your body. He says, therefore, brethren, I beseech you by, by the mercies of God that you would, what, present your body a living sacrifice. You go, hold, hold it now. Hold, hey, just a minute now. Hey, I can show up on Sundays, but you know what? Uh, I'm not too sure about this giving you my whole body, my whole life, everything about me, giving it over to you. And then all of a sudden, Jesus says, well, well, you know, hey, you know, this whole thing about giving your body, uh, I sort of did that on the cross of Calvary where I stepped up and took your place and went on the cross of Calvary. I gave my body for you to simply give your body back to me. And he says, I want you to praise me. I want you to worship me. Well, God, that, that's pretty difficult. There's a lot of things. Well, you know that very breath that you have in you? I want you to take that very breath that's in you that I gave you and just begin to give me some of it back. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Give some of it back. He says, I want you to serve me. Well, God, you know, I'm pretty busy these days. God, you know, it's just been a little difficult. You know, I'm trying to work things out, and, you know, I'm not too sure if I really can. I've got much time left for you. And this is, hey, well, just don't worry about it while I'm down here washing the feet of my disciples, including one who's going to doubt me and one who's going to rebuke me and one who is going to betray me. And as he begins to wash the disciples' feet, he picks up the cloth and throws it back to the disciples and says, now you do the same thing. Well, okay, maybe I can serve you a little bit. And let's think about giving just for a second. You know, you just start talking about money and everybody all of a sudden just begins to squeeze back into their chair. But, you know, we, we don't give to God. You know, I, I tithe, I practice tithing all, all my life. But I don't give the tithe, I return the tithe. The tithe is the 10% of the 100% that God gives me. The tithe is the 10%. I don't give to God. I say, oh, God, out of my benevolence, God, okay, I'm just, I'll give you 10 just to help you out. No, I'm, I'm returning the 10. I'm returning what God already gave me. I'm giving him the tithe, the 10% back to him. And say, and God simply says, well, by doing that, you manage the 90, and I'll help, I'll help you in the whole scheme of things. And it's coming back to remember that what we have faith to receive, God says, can you be faithful to return? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Faithfulness is about returning. It's about bringing back to God what's rightfully his. And that's what this one leper does. It's easy to be the nine. It's costly to become the one. The one that Jesus lifts up. And here's a truth for you. Let me, I put it in these words up on the screen. God will never ask from you something that wasn't already his. If he asks something that belongs to you, belongs to you, that's stealing. But if God is simply asking from you something that he already gave you, 
That's not. He, he's not asking something from you that wasn't already his. 1 Timothy 6.17, I love this. It says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, proud, self, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. He gives us all things to enjoy. Everything that God has created, he puts it out and he says, hey, you enjoy it. The mountains, go ski, have a good time. Water, water ski, go have, swim, do whatever. He says, go on, you like to hike, go, on, go hike, it's mine. I'm saying go enjoy it. But then he also takes it and he says, hey, the job I give you, enjoy it. Hey, that, that, that spouse that you weren't expecting, enjoy. That family, enjoy. That relationship, that church, that forgiveness, the healing, all of a sudden everything else that we've received because nothing that we have, we didn't receive from God. He says, but I want you to enjoy it. There's nothing that God will give you and say, I don't want you to enjoy that. Don't, don't enjoy that. Hey, that relationship I gave, don't enjoy that relationship. Everything God gives us is it's for you to enjoy. God holds nothing back. Everything's for our enjoyment. All God says is that in all the giving and in all the receiving, can there be faithfulness for the return? Faith isn't finished until it's faithful. This one return fell down, worship the Lord. Be the one that keeps coming back. Get offended, keep coming back. You get hurt, faithful is coming back. All of a sudden, life doesn't turn out the way you want. Can you keep coming back? Can you be faithful? Can you say, I'm going back. I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to be in church. I'm going to be with God and God's people. I'm going to grow from being having faith to receive that I'm going to be faithful to return. And all of a sudden out of that, there's fruit that comes in the most difficult of times. There's the workings of God in your character in the most difficult of times because you have chosen to be faithful. Not just faith to receive, but faithful to return with gratitude. He returned, fell down, and worshiped the Lord. Be the one. Don't be settled for being the nine. Oh, I'll just receive. Can you be the one that returns no matter how life becomes difficult? Have a life of gratitude. You come back, you serve, you come back, you give, you come back, you help, you come back and you bring others with you. You go from receiving to returning from being one that simply is a uh, consumer to becoming a contributor. You're returning. And here's a thought, can you be the one even when the nine don't come back? When the rest of the people around you are not returners, they're only receivers, can you be the one that is a returner? That you don't just have faith like everybody else, you're willing to be faithful. Make choices now, young. Say, I'm gonna do it now, not wait. Live your life knowing that Jesus gave you everything, died for you, hung on the cross, held nothing back. So here's my questions to all of us. What are you holding back? What are you hesitant right now to give back to God? Because everything you have is from God. What are you holding back? What are you hesitant about? Ask yourself this question. What have I been hurt by or offended by? What person is there in my life that right now I'm holding back because I don't want to get hurt again? Because I don't want to be offended again. I don't want to be stepped on again. So you're holding back because... It's not worth getting hurt, you say. But can I tell you, you will never grow in the character of Christ until you are willing to be faithful, even in the most difficult of times. Are you willing to be a steward, not an owner? Because God blesses the stewards, not the owners. God always looks at the stewards, the talents of 10, five, and one, or five, three, and one, it's the stewards that were faithful that were able to enter into the joy of the Lord. They're the ones that were able to have a commendation. Let me end with this out of Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 1 to 11. Paul 
great dissertation, talks about redemption, talks about Christ and his sacrifice and all the benefits, everything, chapters 1 through 11. It's, all, it's a beautiful. Then he gets to the end of chapter 11, and he says this in 1133. Have you ever come on anything quite like this extravagant generosity of God, the deep, deep wisdom? He's talking about everything that he's just talked about. It's way over our heads. We've never figured it out. Is there anyone around who can explain God? Anyone smart enough to tell him what to do? Anyone who has done him such a great, huge favor that God has to ask his advice? Everything that comes from him, God, everything happens through him. Everything ends up in him. Always glory, always praise. Yes, yes, yes. He says everything is about God. Everything came from God, for God, through God. Everything's about God. Then he says Romans 12, 1. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take every day, your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. You want God to work in your life beyond just that receiving of what your faith got you? God will bring more into your life because you're faithful, because you're coming back, you're returning. There's a heart of gratitude in every part of your life. You're giving back to God. This leper did just that. He obeyed, returned, fell down in worship. When's the last time you had that encounter? When's the last time you had that leper encounter with God? Where you simply fell down and worshiped him? Where you simply obeyed and just returned back to him, not wanting anything? You just returned it all back to him and said, I don't even deserve this. And yet it's mine. God, I give it back to you. I return faithful. Don't just have faith. Be a people of God that are faithful. Because in being faithful, God gives more into your life than you can possibly imagine. He will take you to realms that you can't even begin to fathom. But it starts with that encounter, not just knowing Christ, but then returning back everything to Christ. Be the one. The challenge is be the one. Don't be the nine. Be the one. How many of you say you see a different message than you've ever read before and you say, I, I needed that lesson. I need that encouragement. I need to be challenged to be the one, not the, not the nine. Why don't we stand up here this morning? Let's stand here. Let's... Offer the Lord our lives, Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. You know, Peter says, hey, Jesus, I'm willing to die for you. Jesus looks at Peter and goes, who's talking about death? Live for me. Present your body a living sacrifice. Just do what I want you to do. Have enough faithfulness just to respond in obedience every day of your life with a heart of gratitude. Let's just... Uh, might not be your customer. Why don't we just raise our hand like this, two hands, and just say, Cause we, we, want, we want to give, not receive. This is a giving posture. We want to give to the Lord. Lord God, we give to you right now our lives, living sacrifice. We give to you, Lord, our bodies. We give you, Lord, our, our dreams. We give you, Lord, what we think is important. We now say, God, it's not important. It's got to be about you. Jesus, you're the center of everything, of our homes, of our marriages, of our lives, our school, our jobs. God, we come back to you and say, God, it's yours anyway. God, our, our, our dreams and our, our hopes, our jobs, our finances, the homes you get, whatever you give us, God, it's from you. We give it back to you. God, if we're fighting to be owners, we lay it down and we say we're stewards. And we're going to prove that by giving it all back to you, God. If there's anyone here right now, you've been reluctant to give back to God because of a hurt, an offense, a situation of life that just pulled you back. Lord Jesus, I pray for those individuals right now that they'd be released of that offense, that hurt, that they would no longer be held back of giving to you, Lord, the areas of their life, because they said they'll, they'll control it because then they won't get hurt. No, God, you've got to control it. You've got to control everything, Lord, including even our, our finances, including our families, including our marriages. You've got to control it because we will mess it up. Lord Jesus, I pray for this house. I pray blessing, finances, direction. I pray, oh God, healing. Establish, oh Lord, your favor over every heart and every life. God, we realize everything comes from you. And God, we just walk in humility and say thank you. 
We return back to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we worship the Lord here? now. Lord, I just thank you that you're always nudging us. You're nudging us further into that relationship with you. You're drawing us. And Lord, right now, I know there's hearts that are being pulled closer to you right now. Lord, nudge them by your Holy Spirit to come closer, to be willing to give up control, be willing to give up their own sense of control of their lives to prevent hurt or disappointment or discouragement. God, it's healing and life is only found in you. And I pray today, Lord, be a dedicating of our lives to be not just the nine, but become the one. That we would be faithful. That we would have faithfulness in us, Lord, on a daily basis to return in gratitude and thanksgiving and surrender and say, God, we're not the boss. We're not the boss, you're the boss, and everything flows from you. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Well, I encourage you, stay in the word, stay in the presence of God. Find times throughout the week 
where you simply fall down on your face, you worship him, and you just come and give him thanks. Remind yourself that everything comes from him. Amen. Well, we've got coffee out front, and we've got some Tim Hortons cookies for everyone to enjoy, chunks of chocolate, oatmeal raisin. Come on. Enjoy them. Enjoy some fellowship. It's great to see one another. Reacquaint yourselves with some people. There's some new people in the house that you haven't seen before. Get to know them. God bless you. Have a great day. Prayer on Wednesday night here in the sanctuary. We're actually meeting here. But uh, God bless you and enjoy this great day.